uh, distress can be a problem. So there are a whole host of health and behavioral issues that an animal can experience when they're experiencing, when they're under distress. So for health issues, again, y'all know way more about the details of each of these, but just as a summary, uh, they experience reduced immune function because the body is redirecting energy towards uh, other largely behavioral, some other processes to help them escape or habituate from the stressor. So though that means that some of this energy is not being directed towards other processes that are required for growth, reproduction, all sorts of other things that are deemed non-essential by the body at that time. Uh, there can be a lot of psychological suffering or long-term trauma associated with this. Sometimes, probably not the people in this room, but many people are quick to say, well, uh, he went through something bad, but I'm over it, he's a dog. But there's a lot of research coming out that says that's not really the case. There is long-term psychological effects associated with experiencing distress. There's also weight loss and inappetence. Everyone here, I'm sure, is well aware of the fact that if a cat is stressed out in the shelter, it does not eat. And so that, that really has um, the, the ability to impact a lot of things, like we can't really give them all their meds because we can't stuff it in food. Um, they are gonna lose weight, which might cause current health conditions to deteriorate or new health conditions to occur. Uh, and of course, uh, infectious disease such as upper respiratory tract infection, which can rock through a shelter really quickly and is really, really um, made much more worse and much more likely by stress. Behavior issues, this is just a short list, but uh, if an animal's stressed out, they're much more likely to be aggressive or withdraw uh, or really flee away from you as well. So those are the fight, flight, the, the four Fs. Uh, and so um, these are different coping mechanisms that an animal might use to get away from a stressor in the wild, but are not necessarily, especially aggressive, not necessarily um, safe for the people who are encountering them in the shelter. And, and importantly, not going to make them seem very adoptable. It's hard for uh, people who are coming to look at our pets to, to see how a pet like that might fit into their home. So it's really important. Um, it's really important for their well-being that we re we reduce their distress distress to help with the health issues and the behavior issues. Uh, and this third one might seem a little bit more superficial, but really the easiest way to reduce their stress is to get them out of the shelter altogether. So making them seem less or more friendly and adoptable is one of the best things we can do for them long term. So what in the shelter is it that really stresses them out? What stressors do they encounter? Which things are potential to be stressful, depending on how they perceive them? Well, first of all, there's a separation from the familiar. Everything they're used to, everything they love, everything that brings them joy, every part of their normal routine, all of that stuff is gone. And it's coupled with exposure to a whole host of new things. And some animals might perceive novelty more stressful than others. But often, this can be a very big source of stress. They're also confined. So this reduces uh, their opportunity for uh, exercise, but it also, uh, really limits their ability to flee. So if an animal can't flee, they are much more likely to be aggressive on top of that because you're removing one of their coping mechanisms. So they're gonna be more quick to, to use, reach for the aggression. Um, there are tons of noises. As everyone knows, the shelter is a really noisy place from clattering bowls to children laughing and running through adoption rooms. There's a lot of noises that have the potential to be very stressful to animals in the shelter. And of course, there's the lack of stimulation. We do our best to provide lots of enrichment and engagement opportunities, interaction with humans. But of course, we are never going to achieve a typical home environment level of uh, stimulation. Uh, so that is how stress works. That's how stress works in a shelter. And if we want to try to reduce this stress, especially at the beginning, but really at any time, this is where we want to work. We want to try our best to make it seem as though they are not going to perceive our environment as stressful in the beginning, as risky in the beginning, but let's be real, that's going to happen with a lot of individuals, especially cats. So then at that point, what we really want to do is work on this point. So making sure that they have the tools, the resources available to make them feel like they are able to habituate to these things they perceived as risky or to escape from these things that they think are risky. And so these are the two kind of pain points that we try to hit through our uh, um, interventions. Um, first, I also want to talk a little bit about how animals experience stress in the shelter environment during this initial period. So there's a lot of literature out there on how cats respond to habituate to the shelter environment. So most of it points to it being about three to five days overall, so this is not every cat, this is the average cat, uh, three to five days while they um, 
kind of reach a baseline in their CAT stress score. For, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the CAT stress score, it's an ordinal rating system from one to seven, with one being relaxed and seven being terrified. And it looks at 11 different postural or uh, behavioral categories of the cat, so pupil size, uh, vocalizations, body posture, all those things. And then the cat's assigned a score. And if you look at these scores over time, there's so many studies that show that it takes about three to five days uh, for the cats to kind of reach a baseline in this in this score. Here you can see the top study that I've just populated. Um, the different groups aren't really that important for us to talk about, but the, in cats in these different groups, two of them showed it took about four days to reach the baseline, and one of them showed it took five days to reach the baseline. I'm not going to talk about whether it is better to keep cats housed singly or housed in pairs, because that's a whole other topic. Uh, but, and it's important to know that this study came out in 1997. <laughs> I like to think that shelter conditions have improved over time. So more recent studies do show uh, different, that it's more along the three day point. So forget for a moment the control group in this, which is this, the dotted line. We will talk about that group in a future slide. However, if you just look at the dark line, that is a cat that has a, access to a hiding box, which is most cats in most shelters. And you'll see here that uh, day one and day two and they, uh, by day three, they kind of reach that stabilized point. So we're seeing the cats, on average, reach this kind of stasis after about three days. But this final study here shows a similar pattern that after, I think here it's after four days, um, there is no significant difference in cat stress score. However, we're breaking it down. This isn't just average cats on average. This is bold versus shy cats. So we can see that from the top two graphs that overall cats on average take about three to five days. But if we look at them by cats that are really bold, that's the dark line on the bottom, they seem to be pretty cool with it all the time. So these are cats that enjoy novelty and are really curious and then their cat stress score is pretty baseline most of the time. But these shy cats, we can see they really see a decline in them over time. So it just goes to show that you really need to treat animals. I mean there are general patterns across species, but within, there are individuals, and we need to keep that, and you don't just say, we do this for cats, we say. We treat shy cats like this, bold cats like this, and then think of each individual variable within that, and how we can help them to uh, perceive the environment differently. So these bold cats, perhaps they are more likely to be stressed by um, lack of stimulation, lack of just something to do, whereas the shy cats are more stressed by the being on display and the novelty, and just thinking about how they engage with their environment differently, and what different stressors might impact them. Finally, there's this last study that looks at, uh, it looks at cat stress score here, but it also looks at a couple of other variables. So here we see percentage of time spent eating, percentage of time spent grooming, and cortisol. So this study didn't break it down like, by day like these other do. It looked at week one, week two, week three, week four, and week five. But we can see, if you look at these little superscript things, if they're different, that means the groups are different. So here you'll see there's an A at week one, and weeks two, three, four, and five all have Bs. So it shows you that after week one, on average, cats eat more, they groom less, they have lower cat stress scores, the cortisol is a little bit more murky because you can see there's a difference between week one and week five, but weeks two, three, and four are kind of that middle ground. But this is just more evidence that shows us, using more than just the cat stress score, that it's this first, at very least, less than or equal to seven days, probably more in that three to five day picture that we really are seeing this adjustment of cats for dogs, the picture is a little bit more complicated. Um, we don't see as clear a picture as average overall for dogs. Like we see, you see these top two graphs for cats. It's like, on average, they go down. This here is uh, looking at cortisol, urinary to cortisol to creatinine ratio in dogs. Um, and we can see it really, they, they tried to look at it overall. And it was just noise. There was no pattern in the data. Uh, but then they started breaking out and finding these similar groupings of dogs. And they found that... Uh, like some dogs, uh, their cortisol really just goes up over time. This here is day two, day five, and day 10 in all of these graphs. Whereas in graph B, uh, it started low, it went up on day five and then went down on day 10. And then you can see sort of the opposite in, in graph D where it went high, then they kind of calmed down, then they got really stressed again. So it just shows you that dogs don't really experience stress in the shelter in the same way that cats do. Where, and my, suspe my suspicion for this is that the difference between dogs and cats is likely due to their difference in socialization. So by the nature of dogs, we take them to dog parks, we take them to puppy classes, we take them to our friend's house. They're kind of socialized to a lot of things that even your friendliest house cat doesn't really get to see. I mean, there are adventure cats, people take kayaking, but aside from them, um, we have uh, most cats 
maybe see your friend if they come over during the pandemic, not even that. So these cats, while they may be quite well socialized to you, they're not socialized to novelty, which is the, one of the main stressors of the shelter. And so that, I think, is why we're not seeing that same initial stress from really all dogs and it taper off like with cats. Um, it's hard to say, but another thing that really leads to that uh, hypothesis is that sometimes for dogs from our more northern communities or uh, that maybe perhaps weren't socialized as well as some of the, the city dogs that go out to all the things, we do seem to see, anecdotally, a higher stress response initially in the shelter from those dogs and it follows a very similar pattern to that which we see in cats. So I would suspect that it really does another way you need to think about these animals as individuals. If they come from an area where they're very likely to find the shelter environment novel, it's, it's probable, and they're not used to novelty in general, it's probable they're going to experience a higher actual stress at the beginning and then taper off. And then with dogs in general, we do tend to see um, higher kennel stress the longer they've been there. This is anecdotal again. So I would suspect that some of these more well socialized dogs, they're seeing more stress as uh, time goes on because of probably more of these like confinement based issues, uh, a lack of proper stimulation issues, and not having their person, like having one person that is a, a constant in their life that is a caregiver that they can kind of draw security and comfort from. So yeah, it just shows you that dogs and cats experience the shelter stress differently, and then within dogs and within cats, there are still individual differences as well. Okay, I have no idea how long I've been talking for so far. Hopefully I have plenty of time left. So in order to start an animal off right, and actually indeed for the rest of their time, these six categories are all very important. Uh, so I'm gonna go through each of them separately, and when, uh, just to keep everyone clear on which one I'm talking about at the time, you'll see the color and the, the word at the top of the slide, just it's a little heading. So, to start an off animal off right, first we think a lot about housing. Um, so, some shelters have what they have and that's it. And it's, you really don't have a lot of options. But many shelters, there's different places, different um, ways you can be creative about which part of the uh, shelter facility is most appropriate for each animal. Really trying to be strategic with how you use your differences in your housing environments. So first of all is the size. So you'll see on the left here what's called a kitty corral. Uh, so it's basically just like a big area. It's just a cage that's really big, essentially. But if you think about um, that cat that's terrified in its cage and it feels it can't flee, so its first urge is to be aggressive, these are the cats that we put in out of cage space immediately. If you have a cat that's aggressive in cage, you don't know why, but it, a very high likelihood is that it uh, doesn't have the ability to engage in fleeing behavior. So it's panicking and going straight to fight. And we do find, again anecdotally, but if we move these cats into out of cage space, we see a huge reduction in aggression, which is very important for the animal's well-being, but also safety of our staff. So we take that very seriously, and that is our first move with that. Um, in terms of location, um, this is important for a number of reasons. So if an animal is very stressed, we like to try to keep them kind of off exhibit, so not in public areas, uh, because then there's just gonna be less traffic walking by, less likelihood of someone kind of putting their fingers in the kennel or the cage and stressing the animal out. So having these off exhibit areas where the public isn't really welcome or, or able to go without um, somebody, like an adoption agent with them at least, it's really helpful for helping to deal with these animals who are really perceiving the environment as quite stressful and it's this novelty and the constant change and people walking through motion, noise, trying to just kind of make it so they're a little bit less overwhelmed by that. Then we have sensory blocking. This comes in a number of ways, one of which would be in the kennel environment if you're able to put in sound baffles to dampen the volume of barking that can help a lot. Um, and we also have a sheet over a dog kennel here so this is used for dogs that are really very reactive especially at the beginning or dogs that seem to be very stressed by people walking by and we can't move them off exhibit what have you. We also use towels over cage fronts for cats. Um, sometimes we'll do two towels and then as they get a little bit better we'll take off one towel so we're increasing the ability to perceive these potential threats but still doing it gradually. Um, also keeping cats away from dog barking can be a huge one because there's lots, well at least one very good study out there that shows that that's a direct relationship between those two and theoretically also it would be great to keep you know, any small special species or whatever away from cat scents because cat scents are used in a lot of studies looking at stress in rats, where they just use as the stressor the smell of cats. So that's pretty good evidence to try to keep your special species and your cats separate. 
All right, so moving on to general husbandry, um, there's a lot we can do here that has very little cost to the shelter um, in terms of, I mean, shel shelters are short on resources, person hours, money, so whenever we can make an impact on an animal's life cheaply from any of those, the viewpoint of any of those resources, it's the best idea. And so there's a few changes you can do to the animal husbandry routine that really help with this. So the first is providing a regular routine. There's a, a, there's a lot of research that shows that this routine, making sure the animals can predict what times important activities such as meals, play, training, cleaning can come, are going to come, really helps reduce their stress. And that's through the reduction of that anxiety. Because if an animal never really knows, oh no, what are they gonna come in for cleaning? It happens at a different time every day, I'm really scared and I'm worried that they're gonna constantly be in that state of anxiety throughout the day. Whereas if they uh, can predict it, if it becomes, because animals, I mean, if any of you have dogs or cats at home, you know when it's 10 minutes of feeding time, they are super annoying. Animals know routine, they can tell time. And so if you do these at the same time every day, then the animals are able to predict when stressors are coming. So they know, okay, I'm gonna be anxious now because I know cleaning is coming soon. But for the rest of the day, perhaps they can relax a little bit more. So it really does help in that way. Um, yeah, so that's the importance of routine. Next is just generally keeping the volume low. Uh, it's just a really hard habit to break. I think if you ask anyone at any shelter, they know this. It's just that they don't do this because it's really, you get caught up and you're busy and you're rushing around. But there's just a few little things that help a lot. So opening and closing cage doors carefully. At least at our shelter, the cat cages are you know, a little older than we wish they were. And so they don't work quite as well all the time. And so some of them really kind of have to like pull on and they make a very large sound. But I find if you just spend an extra fraction of a second and figure out sometimes the cage doors need to be like lifted a teeny bit while you open them and they're quiet or they have to be pushed down a little bit and you open them and they're quiet. So just doing that can make a huge difference because the volume, but also the vibrations in the cage, cats can feel that and their sensitive little paws and all those things. So just being very careful with that. Using WD-40 on cage wheels and latches between occupants. So often you'll hear somebody pushing some cages or opening a cage and you think, wow, that's really, really, really grindy. And if we just take a second between occupants to address those issues, that can help. And then avoiding shouting in halls, instead walking over to your friend and asking them the question. Uh, not dropping bowls, of course, dropping bowls is an accident. You can't say, well, it's not like I was doing it on purpose. But still, being mindful of that and things like banging litter boxes to empty them, especially in cat rooms. Um, and closing doors whenever you know something, like if there's going to be construction in the hall, close the door. You're still going to hear the construction a little bit. You can dampen it, and every little bit counts. Cleaning practices. So for dogs, uh, especially fearful dogs or dogs where you have any uh, concerns kind of behaviorally at all, it's a really good idea to clean while they're out on a walk. So they don't have to experience the thing at all. They have the great time of having a walk and when they come back their environment's clean, their food's down, their water's fresh, so you don't have to worry about that. For cats, it used to be common practice to um, take the cat, excuse me, put them in a carrier, take them out, clean and replace everything and put the cat back. More commonly, most shelters that I'm aware of really are doing the spot cleaning now where they leave the cat where they are. Uh, they only replace bedding if it's been soiled and they only kind of clean what seems necessary. And that's great because it's less stressful for the cat because cats don't like boxing, surprising. But also it keeps where they've deposited all, they spent all their hard time depositing their pheromones all over the environment to mark it as safe and this helps us to not undo that work. But also making sure that you take that time to make the experience positive. Shelters are short on staff. We can't spend as much time with every animal as we wish we could. But every day, several times a day, they are fed and cleaned. So if we can take the time during, it doesn't even take that much longer really, just make the effort during those experiences to give them something, a little bit of a taste of positive, then that can really go a long way. It gives us more points in the day where they're experiencing something positive, whether that's just speaking gently to them, kind of taking your time with them, using a considerate approach, uh, but also giving them treats and giving them toys, if, if they're allowed extra treats, that is. And when you want them to shift from one side of the cage to the other, kind of luring them with those treats or toys, as opposed to kind of just pushing them or, or whatever other method you might use. And so that's the last point here, which is encourage participation rather than force. And you can see that with the dog in the carrier here, really reaching into a carrier to remove an animal is one of the worst things that you can do because a, a hiding is one of those uh, expressions of behavioral coping mechanism. So they're hiding to conceal themselves from a potential uh, stressor. So they feel that they are 
coping with it, that they are doing something about it. But if you then reach into their safe space and pull them out, then you take away that that they had the impression that at least this fight is a little safer, but then you've made that space more dangerous. So we never like to pull animals out of carriers. Next, enrichment. So another one of these terms, their definitions are thrown around willy-nilly. This is the definition that I use, which is any addition or modification to the environment of an animal resulting in an increase in the environment's quality and a subsequent improvement to the animal's well-being. Importantly, in this definition, we can't just say, Kongs are enrichment. Put them in the cage and say it's enrichment for all animals, because it's not. If a dog doesn't, isn't food motivated, isn't interested, is not a chewer, doesn't have the, I don't know, has their mouth wired shut for some reason, that's not enrichment for that dog, is it? So we need to make sure that we think about the animal tells us what's enriching, not we don't tell the animal what's enriching. Um, and so in order to um, increase the animal's quality, we need to be mindful of the needs of that species, but also the needs of that individual. And these are two kind of ideas I keep harping on throughout this whole talk, is that species-specific must consider, but also individual. Um, and different needs that they might experience would be the need for safety or security, the need for stimulation, the need for social companionship, the need to express species' typical behavior, and the need for comfort. And these are all needs we can address with enrichment. Um, and the first one I'm mainly, well, the one I'm mainly going to focus on here is the need for safety and security. This is definitely what we want to address at the beginning of the shelter period, especially for these animals that are experienced kind of that fear drop-off, uh, whereas some of the other ones who are bold right from the get-go, their need might more be a need for express species typical behavior or social companionship or stimulation, probably. But I'm really mostly going to focus on this need for safety and security here. Okay. Here are a million types of enrichment. As you can see, I categorize them into structural, social, cognitive, and sensory. Within the literature, you'll see these categorized in different ways. And then within each category, I've just given some examples. Um, and I mean, this is academic. This is for conceptualizing. This is for thinking about other enrichments we could offer. Most types of enrichment really do fall within multiple of these categories. Just think of a cat tree. It is vertical space. It's a hiding opportunity. They usually have a little hut. Uh, there's resting spots, there's often scratching posts, um, sometimes there's toys, there's like those little hanging body things from them, and if you put them next to a window, there's visual stimulation. So they, they really do combine, but I like to think of them separately, just to kind of get to the heart of what I, why I'm providing each type of enrichment and how the specific type is designed for that need. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I can't talk about all of these and the amount of time we have today, so I'm just going to focus on hiding opportunities, music, human interaction, and conspecifics. So first we're doing hiding opportunities. So this graph in the bottom left may be familiar to you. We talked about it earlier. Um, you can see at that bottom line where the stress kind of reduces and then stabilizes after three days. The top line, not quite such a clear picture. It takes a lot longer for their stress to reduce. This is from a study that looked at um, the value of giving cats hiding boxes. And so the difference between these two lines is the top one, the cats don't have a hiding box. That's the only difference between these two groups. So you can see how, how powerful providing that hiding box is to how the cat perceives the environment. Because they believe that they are using a coping ne mechanism to um, cope with the stress, to escape the stress. They've concealed themselves from the potential stressor. They're still probably pretty stressed, but uh, more stressed than they would be in, a, in an ideal environment. But this gives them the, the, if they feel like they have more agency over their ability to cope with the stressor. And so that's huge. These other two graphs over here, this is from a different study, but they also looked at hiding boxes. So you can see on the y-axis we have the cortisol. And then each bar is a cat store put in a different uh, test group. So the cats on the left, it's in box, they had a hiding box. Cats in the center, they had a perching shelf, but no hiding opportunities. And then the last was the control cats. And you can see that there's a significant difference. The cats in the hiding box group were significantly lower cortisol levels than the control group. And then in the next graph, which is uh, how much food they ate in grams per day, you can see the cats in the hiding box group ate significantly more than the cats in the control group. So this box, we can see just giving cats a hiding box improves their cat stress score, their cortisol, and their how much food they ate. And these are huge, and so this is great evidence, although I believe most, most shelters are probably hiding, giving hiding boxes these days. But hiding is a behavioral coping mechanism for perceived threats, providing opportunities to hide can have dramatic impacts on well-being for cats. We also provide it for dogs in cases where the dogs are quite stressful, but if for dogs that are bold and outgoing, this seems to be um, a less important type of enrichment. We wouldn't prioritize this one over other types. 
cats and dogs experience sound in a very different way than we do. Um, their ear shape is very precise for finding where the music, the sound is coming from. They can hear different frequencies than we can, and so it's, it's obviously we have to think about their experience with sound in a way that we might not perceive it. So music can be great to play because one of the reasons is if you if it's really quiet somebody drops a clanging bowl to the ground, that can be really scary, you know, you throw the popcorn kind of situation, startles you. Um, but if you're already watching a movie and then somebody drops a bowl in the kitchen, you're not going to have that same startle response because instead of going from zero to 60, it's like from 40 to 60. And so just generally having music on in the shelter during the day can help with uh, that startle response to unexpected sounds. But moreover, what music you actually play makes a difference in both dogs and cats. I only have examples from cats on this screen, but I will talk about dogs as well. Cats' papers just had better graphs, so that's why we're going through this. Uh, so, first thing I want to talk about is David T.E.'s Music for Cats. So it is a music that's designed uh, that is ecologically appropriate for cats with pulse and pitch rate in mind. If you want more explanation of how that's done, look at the paper. It was a little beyond me, but I just trust it. Um, so, looking through a couple studies, the first top left study is really just they played two speakers. Uh, the speaker on the left uh, was playing music for cats and the bar representing the, speak the other speaker, the bar that's on the right, that was classical music. And they simply measured like frequency of interest behavior. So things like you know, approaching, rubbing up against, things like that. And you can see that the, the, the speaker that played the music for cats was super much higher. So you might hear the idea of someone designing music for cats and thinking, that's hogwash, that's ridiculous, but science is actually showing it's doing something. So they're much more interested in that music, but is interest good, is interest bad, does it really have any power over their stress levels? This next study looked at, um, during a veterinary exam, they played cat stress, uh, me, the music for cats, how did that impact it? And here we can see the three different uh, whisker plots, I think those are called. Um, and so we see silence, classical, and cat music. So in this group, they, they didn't play any music. In this group, they played classical music. And in this group, music, uh, excuse me, this group, they played David T.E.'s music for cats. And you can see that the cat stress score, again, a measure you're all very familiar with by now, I'm sure, was much significantly lower in the cat music group compared to the classical music group and the silence group. And then this one over here is an HS stands for handling score. So veterinarians among you are probably perking your ears up right now, but basically, that means that the veterinarians had a much easier time handling these cats in the cat music for cats group versus both the silence and classical music group. So that shows that this isn't just, you know, whistle and Dixie. This is actually something that is doing something for the animals. Now, in terms of dogs, I had all of my notes about the dog studies in the notes slide, so I'm going to do my best to remember what it said. But basically, they look, there have been many, many more studies on the music and dogs research. Um, and different studies looked at different genres of music, which is, I think, the cutest part of looking at these. You're like comparing pop to soft rock to country to reggae. And uh, different studies showed different things, but in general, they showed a reduction and there is no real analog to the cat stress score. But they, uh, they looked at, you know, amount of time spent uh, barking or pacing or things like that. And a different studies showed that different genres of music were the best, but the ones that came out in the lead were soft rock, reggae, which I think is so cute, um, and you know, audiobooks showed a lot of uh, really good response as well. So the idea of just having audiobooks on is, um, seems like a, a valuable thing. And the one that showed the worst was heavy metal, so avoid heavy metal. <laughs> okay, so here we have human interaction. For a lot of this, I've talked about cats, because let's be honest, my background is mostly in cats. Uh, but this really is uh, one of the types of enrichment where you should have human interaction for your cats as well. But the best evidence for how to reduce stress in shelters is human interaction for dogs. So there's so many papers on this. This is such an important part of any uh, enrichment plan that you should have. So this, this is all from one study. And they looked at, uh, so this is the cortisol here, and then this would be before the human interaction, I believe this is serum cortisol, and this would be after the human interaction. Um, my explanation of this study was on my notes slide, so I'm going to do this a bit from memory. But so basically, they tested their cortisol, they had a human, well, the test condition here, and then they tested their cortisol again. And here you can see what the different test conditions were. So the three black uh, icons, we're all human involved. So uh, in those three, as well as the clear uh, square, they took the dogs to, let's say, an arena um, or just an empty room, and maybe it was a dog park, 
and then they left the dog in there. In the clear circle, excuse me, the clear square, uh, there was, they were alone. There was no human in there. But in each of the three black icons, there was a human involved. In the triangle, the human didn't do anything. They didn't interact with them. They just kind of sat there quietly, didn't even look at them. And then in the diamond, they pet the dog. And in the square, they played with the dog. And you can see in each of these, oh, and these, these are all dogs that had been in the shelter for less than 40 hours. Uh, you can see that in all three of the human-involved interactions, we see these stars, which indicate a significant decline in their cortisol. Um, whereas in the two clear ones, where they didn't have any interaction with the human, even if that interaction was just the human ignoring them, uh, there was no reduction in cortisol. So this is huge to me to show the reduction in, in cortisol that can be done just from human interaction. Um, and then also, moreover, than just the cortisol, we're looking at some behavioral parameters as well. So we look at vocalizations and seconds panting. So I'm not sure if the top one is number of vocalizations or seconds vocalizing. Let's just, let's call it seconds vocalizing. Um, you can see that the dogs in isolation were vocalizing much, much more than the dogs in the passive stranger or the pet or the play conditions. So the dogs that were alone in that arena were bark, 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 barking, and the dogs that were with a human, even if they were passive, were much less likely to vocalize. And then the same with the panting, although here are the only ones they compared were the seconds panting in the isolation phase and the passive stranger. Most likely because in the pet and play, uh, you would expect dogs to be panting more if they're playing, you know, you throw it a toy and make them run back, that would be my assumption. But yeah, so we can see huge differences uh, between these potential welfare parameters just from the human interaction. And in fact, there was, this was 40 minutes of human interaction, and since then there's been another study by, by McGowan et al. And they wanted to know is if you just have 15 minutes to interact with a dog, is that going to do the dog any good? Is that more harm than good? How's that going to impact the dog? But they showed a dramatic impact on things like uh, a reduced heart rate, increased heart rate variability, um, a number of behavioral parameters, which I can't remember what they were off the top of my head, they're on this line. But yeah, so even just 15 minutes is a huge impact on these dogs' well-being. Um, so conspecifics, which really just means the other members of that species. A um, couple of good examples here, uh, the ASPCA Behavioral Rehabilitation Center, which used to be in New Jersey, I think it's now in South Carolina. They have this awesome, awesome program where they take dogs who are like really severe behavior cases. I think they're often from dog fighting rings and stuff like that. And they try to socialize them to be appropriate for life in a home environment. And they have this huge protocol that they use, but when the dog gets about halfway through the protocol, they use that dog as a helper dog for the dogs who are new in the program. And so just kind of that alert, social learning and, uh, and companionship is really helpful in helping them socialize uh, and learn. And so that's great. We do that at Toronto Humane Society as well, especially for dogs that uh, we find have a hard time returning to kennel or leaving kennel, which is a huge problem more than you'd think. And so sometimes we'll just have another dog walk by and then they'll be like, okay, we're walking. And so it just really helps facilitate a lot of different things. For hoarding or former colony cats, this can be huge. Uh, also, probably hoarding dogs, but we really do use this a lot for hoarding, uh, hoarding cats or colony cats. These animals are typically not very well socialized to humans, but they're super well socialized to other cats. And so not only would having another cat around likely be good for their well-being, but having another cat around, especially if it's from the same group that they already know, this can really help them to come out of their shell. These two cats here, they are, I wanna say they're currently in the shelter, but I think they went to foster yesterday. These are two cats that we got from a hoarding facility and they were terrified. We weren't seeing really any behavior from them. You know what I mean, those cats that are just hiding and staring at you, no behavior, no sniffing your finger, no eating treats. And this was like the day or maybe the day after we reintroduced them, they were in separate cages, we put them together in one room. And they are like out in front of people, playing with people, just a huge turnaround in their behavior almost immediately. Now most are not this dramatic, but this one was, and it was, it, now they are even enjoying petting. Like they probably would have before after more time perhaps, but this allowed us to just be quicker about it, which is really good for uh, reducing the potential for distress and that long-term trauma response. And then play groups. Play groups are a great way um, to get dog play groups, let's be clear, uh, a great way to get uh, a little bit more exercise for your dogs, a little bit more socialization, get to express some more species specific behaviors that we don't really see as much when playing with humans as we do see when playing with other dogs. Can I get a time check? I don't have a time piece up here. You have more than 15 minutes. Left. Okay, good. All right. Okay. 
Interaction style. I'm going to go a bit quicker, even though I'm probably already going super quickly. So try to stay with me. A uh, considerate approach this is really important for cats and dogs. It sets the tone for any interaction. Uh, so it's really just making sure that you're approaching them in a way that you're not threatening them. So all the stuff on this slide is true. I'll just rattle through them. I'm sure none of this is shocking to you, but turning your body sideways so you're not kind of square on in a threatening way. Getting as small as possible so if, you know, you're going up to a cage front, you kind of just, if they're in the bottom cage, make sure you're squatting down. Limiting your eye contact and avoiding sustained eye contact. So this doesn't mean don't, you can't look at them in the eye. It just means like, you know, if you're having a conversation with someone and you're just staring at them down the whole time, that could be intimidating to anyone. So just making sure that if you do look at them, you kind of turn your eye glaze away a little bit and look and then look away and so that they don't feel that it all focuses on them. Verbalizing soothingly and gesturing enticingly. So by that, I just mean like, yee, yee, yee. it doesn't matter what you say. I often say the dumbest things. So just giving that vibe that you're really there, you're interested in a friendly interaction. Very, of course, important to avoid startling doing this. So you don't want to really be banging on the cage floor or really going to get hard, but avoiding movements. Um, it could be easy. Sometimes I see people at the cage interacting with the cat super well. And then someone will they'll be, want more treats or something. They'll go, hey, Jerry, can you grab me the treats? And you're like, you're still right there. Even if you're talking to someone else, so just being mindful of those types of things. Um, and of course, bribing them, offering them treats or food. Hopefully they'll take it. They don't always when they're fearful. And if you want to begin petting with a cat, the best advice is really just to ask permission. So it's kind of a greeting. You just offer your finger down low right in front of the cat. It's meant to mimic uh, nose touching when cats greet each other in the wild. And they can either consent or not consent. So they, if, they, if they push into your hand and kind of start, of course, pet them. But if they don't, and they're not showing any other signs of wanting to be pet, don't pet them. You can always ask again later and try to interact with them with a hands-off approach until then. With dogs, we see a similar thing. We really need to use this considerate approach. So again, presenting the side of your body, again, limiting eye contact. If they're over aroused, we like to wait for calm behavior, so four on the floor. And if they're nervous, we like to try to encourage them to come to us, set the tone for the interaction, give them that choice. Again, we want to try to get as small as possible, seem unintimidating. It's about that perception. Do they perceive you as risky or do they perceive you as safe? Um, and we often leave leashes on our dogs uh, if they have some issues with being clipped on. So if that's the case, you need to make sure you're sliding the, the hook under the door slowly and tossing treats while you're doing it, because that could be scary as well. Uh, obviously, always avoid bending, standing, or reaching over the dog. Make sure that you remain calm. Animals pick up on this kind of thing, so if you're scared, they will be freaking out too. And then using a verbalizing soothingly and gesturing enticingly and avoiding startling. So a lot of the same things between the two animals. Uh, and now we are, okay, now we're talking about training and behavior modification. One of our best tools is desensitization and counter conditioning. I was trying to avoid using, you know, pictures that we didn't have like license to. So these are the icons I found for free. So we're dealing with tacos and pig boys, but anyway. So uh, desensitization and counter conditioning. So desensitization is gradual exposure to something um, and counter conditioning is uh, pairing something they don't like with food or something they do like, usually food. But it can be play, other things as well. So here's just a little example. So the cat is afraid of the pig boy, but the cat really likes the taco. So through repeated pairings of the pig boy and the taco, with the pig boy getting gradually closer to the cat, the cat will start to like the pig boy as well. They'll have like a, he'll form a, a conditioned, positive, emotional response to the pig boy through repeated pairings with the tacos. And this is a very stupid way to explain desensitization <laughs> and cat conditioning. But here's a video of it in action at Toronto Humane Society. This is how we use, this is our protocol for desensitizing or for socializing kittens. There is also usually music with this, but the music's kind of stupid anyway, so we're not missing anything, don't worry. So you can see the gradual reduction of the space between the food and my hand. And we only progress when she'll actually eat. With cats are great, because eating is basically consent. If they continue to eat, they're comfortable enough to go to the next step. It's uh, baby food. Uh, okay. It's Heinz chicken with broth baby food. Cats love it. And it's no onions or garlic. Okay. 
You may think that this cat was actually socialized when I started, but I assure you she was not. It was just we only take videos and use videos of the best examples of this technique. Most of the time it takes much, much longer. Lennon, as I bet you can guess, came in with three other kittens named uh, McCartney, uh, Star, and uh, Harrison. The other three took a lot longer, but, but she, was, she was easy peasy. Um, took one day. Most of the time it takes much, much longer. Um, but these, pro these steps really do work and we use them with our adult cats as well, but they obviously we don't expect them to necessarily all get to the same end point and we expect them to take much, much longer. But it's just an example of how that works in practice. We also have one more example of training behavior modification um, technique that we use in shelter a lot. This is a treat trail. Treat trails are great because it encourages the animal to uh, have choice and to have agency and they have so much control over how things work. We don't go to the cat. I could have walked right up to this cat and sat next to her and tried to give her treats and try to reach in and pet her, but instead I sat back and uh, tried to encourage her to come to me using this treat trail. Choice is such so great for an animal's confidence and, and their feeling of having some agency in the environment. Um, and so a treat trail, it sounds so simple, but there are a few techniques that I think are really important. So the first being, um, I used to just you know, walk up to the cat, put the treat, put the next treat, put the next treat, and then sit down and wait for them to come to me. But the, te the real way to do it is you throw a treat right in front of the cat's face. I had to practice a lot because my aim is terrible, and with towels and everything in the environment, you can bounce any which way but loose and hit the cat in the face. But as soon as the cat does eat, and of course they're not going to eat every time, but if they do eat, the trick is you want to throw the next treat about two inches closer to you right when the cat's done and about to look up because that motion of seeing the treat drop is what really encourages them to take that next step and come closer to you. Um, and this is Lilith. Uh, this was her first, I was working with her for I don't know how long, and this is the first time she actually came out for me. And so uh, this was a huge one for me and she came out all the way to me. So she was a socialized cat. She was just terrified by the shelter environment. And this was a, an awesome way to get her to do it. And then the next thing is don't pet her, right? Don't pet her at this stage because you've just earned her trust. So no reason to take that trust away. Now, if she asks for petting, rubs up against you, that's a different story. You could also offer your finger and see if she wants the petting, but I try not to ask for too much at a time. And usually I'll end one of these with a big pile of treats or something like that so that it's like a, just a big reward for thank you for coming out and then ending the interaction without uh, pushing it too far. Okay, so our last category is behavior medications. Again, cannot stress this enough, not a veterinarian. So I cannot prescribe any of these meds. I'm just saying what we tend to use and what the literature says about them. So for dogs, for predictably stressful events, so you know that this dog is going to get a shot, uh, or you know that um, there's gonna be construction going on in their hall, and this dog is already prone to stress, uh, we tend to give that dog, uh, I say we, the veterinarians, tend to give that dog gabapentin plus or minus, excuse me, trazodone plus or minus gabapentin. And then for habituating to the shelter environment, so these are those dogs that do express, so we talked about how not all dogs express that kind of downward curve of stress to the environment, but for the ones that do, who are showing poor habituation to the environment, again, they tend to give them trazodone plus or minus habituation. There was an interesting study that came out, excuse me, plus or minus gabapentin, there is an interesting study that came out by Abrams, I think it was 2022 even, that showed um, they gave, I guess they probably had two groups, and they gave this group of dogs, they didn't even look to see is the dog stressed, where the dog come from, like none of that. They just looked at all dogs that came into the shelter, and they gave half the dogs um, trazodone, just one dose of trazodone, maybe it was two. And uh, this group, none. And they looked at, they didn't look at behavioral signs of stress, they didn't look at um, like cortisol or things like that, but they looked at outcome variables between those two groups. And the dogs in the trazodone group had a shorter length of stay, they had a greater likelihood of being adopted within the period of time they were looking at, and some, less likelihood of getting sick. And that's pretty powerful evidence just from this, um, just from the administration of one or maybe two doses of this trazodone. It was a really interesting study. We've been looking at doing a similar study with cats, but we are just keep failing at getting, ah, I keep failing at getting my act together on that. But I do blame go, uh, COVID, so. All right, so for cats, we do, uh, for the predictable stressful events, so this cat has to get into a carrier, this cat has to go for a vet exam, there's going to be uh, uh, construction in that room, we do give them gabapentin. Um, we really do only give this to the super high stress cats as well. And for habituating to the shelter, we look at gabapentin and sometimes clonazepam, alprazolam. I'll talk about uh, some studies looking at gabapentin with cats, 
But uh, the clonazepam or prazolam, I'll tell you right now, there's no, I have not found any study that looks at that. It was kind of just always already a practice that we had when I started at THS. Um, they don't like to, the veterinarians don't like to give it quite as much because it's a controlled substance and a lot, a whole host of other issues. But the training staff, we find it a lot easier because the pill's way smaller and uh, it doesn't taste bad at all. And it also has the benefit of kind of having that, uh, it makes them hungry, and so that gets them eating. And we do really find, anecdotally, we find a kind of a better response from liconazepam, but that is something that I should really be doing some sort of study looking at as well. But the gabapentin is definitely safer and easier, uh, and probably much easier for other shelters that don't have the strong, like the, the huge number of veterinarians on staff. But anyway, the research looking at gabapentin in cats. Predictable stressful events. So we have a study looking at so maybe both of these are, both these studies are predictable stressful events. There's one study that looks at transport of cats to the veterinarian. Again, two groups, one group given the gabapentin, one group not given the gabapentin, and the veterinary handling, uh, ability to handle these cats afterwards, and it was just so much easier. And the cats had much lower stress scores um, in the group that got the gabapentin. And then the other one is cats in uh, traps for TNR. So these are like the stressed of the stressed, obviously. These are our colony cats in these traps. And they showed a dramatic reduction in stress of these cats as well. So gabapentin is a fantastic tool. I mean, in terms of habituating to the shelter, um, there's not really a ton of research on this. However, there is an interesting case study by Von Hoften, who's a veterinary behaviorist who used to be out of you, uh, excuse me, BC, SPCA, I forget where she works now. But she has a cool case study about how they gave gabapentin to an entire group of colony cats that came in. She didn't have a control group, so it's not really, but she was just remarking on the difference in anecdotally, and it's, it was an interesting paper. There's also, increasingly, I'm finding references to using trazodone with cats, but I have no experience with that. I don't believe um, that I've been aware of us using that in our shelter at all, but I'd be interested in looking into that more in the future. I might skip through, well, I'll go through this really quickly, just in the interest of times, but it's just so important that when you're looking at behavioral care, you just don't, as I alluded to earlier, say, I gave him a Kong, he's enriched. You need to really kind of follow up is important. So whenever any animal comes into our shelter and we're concerned for their behavioral welfare, uh, we look at, uh, they're identified for assessment in some way, then we review all available information, usually intake profile, intake profile, intake profile, so much is important information in there. Then we observe their behavior in the shelter. Of course, their behavior in the shelter is not necessarily representative, representative of how they would be in a, in a home environment. However, it is telling you what their welfare in the shelter is right now. So that's important. And then you'd hypothesize the cause for whatever problem behavior you've observed. Uh, then you make an implement a plan. And then very importantly, and very often missed, is this follow-up stage. And if you find it's getting better, great. If you find it's not getting better, you need to go back and reassess. Maybe you missed some important information. Maybe your hypothesized cause was wrong. And then eventually, of course, all the animals have one of three, really, uh, endpoints. Um, and we all hope for adoption, of course. Alternative placement can, but alternative placement and euthanasia can both be the appropriate uh, endpoint in some cases. We need to think of what's kind to the animal, not necessarily what makes us feel good at the end of the day. Okay, just a couple of slides left, and they're all brief, like don't underestimate the value of slides. So staff and volunteer training is crucial. People need to understand what the animal is telling us with their body language. Um, so they need this literacy, but they also need to believe the animal. So they need to be able to tell what the animal is saying and then respond appropriately. Um, they also need to be well-trained in internal procedures for consistency. Consistency is so crucial. If a dog's being taught to, I don't know, sit, but every person who tries to teach a dog to sit is using a different method, that can be very confusing. And if we're trying to get routine for what time this cat is fed, but everyone is using a different routine, all the different shifts, that consistency is just not there. And then obviously documentation and reporting is important because let's say a cat scratches a person once, that's no big deal, right? But if we find that's a pattern, that's when we need to really address that behavior. Of course, I don't mean a cat scratching a person is not a big deal. I just mean from that, it doesn't mean that a cat has a patholog pathological behavior. Um, but if that starts being more and more common, uh, we need to start thinking, well, what, wh how can we improve this cat's life? What are we doing? What could we be doing to help them? And it's only through documenting and reporting so everyone knows, so you can identify these patterns. Don't underestimate the value of stress reduction for safety's sake. So often people talk only about the animals when they're talking about reducing their stress, and of course that's important. But it, a, a, a stressed animal is a more often a more aggressive animal. Maybe that's defensive aggression even, but that's still aggression. And that's, we're putting our staff at risk every day if we're having them. I mean, anytime we interact with an animal free contact, that's going to be potentially risky. We don't think about that very often, but every time you interact with an animal, there is a risk. 
All we need to do is reduce that risk, and that's the stress reduction component of that. Don't underestimate the value of the link between psychological health and physiological health. I have a couple of examples here, but I mean the, the gut-brain pathway is becoming more and more popular in, um, in, in the literature, talking about improving your, your gut uh, biome, microbiome, can improve your anxiety and things like that. And it's true with animals as well. Um, so for cats, uh, uh, we found that, or t Tanaka et al, found that cats with a higher cat stress score were 5.6 times more likely than those with a low cat stress score to develop URI. And that's problematic because URI can increase length of stay, increases their risk of euthanasia, and may spread to other cats in the shelter. So reducing the cat stress score can definitely help with their physiological health. And dogs, we have that example here of the dogs given the trazodone had a shorter length of stay, less lower rates of illness, and an increased chance of adoption. And that's pretty clear evidence of a, of a relationship between anxiety, or stress at least in general, and, and rates of illness. So that's the, the psychological and physiological connection. And finally, don't underestimate the value of getting the animals out of the shelter, whether that's foster or adoption. Adoption obviously is ideal because they're finally in their home and they, they, we no longer have to be attributing resources to them, but also because it's better for the animal to finally be able to get some consistency. But even if you only get the animal out on foster, and even if these foster periods are really short, there could be a lot of value to the animal. So this, these two graphs are from a, a paper on dogs. Uh, in fact, I think they didn't even have the graphs in the paper. I think I created these from the data in their paper, so forgive if they look kind of a lackluster. But uh, this is dogs that went out on foster for, I think, 48 hours. And um, we have uh, before sleepover, so this is while they're still in the shelter, and then when they were in their foster home, and then when they came back from the shelter. And this one on the left here is a urinary cortisol to creatinine ratio. So we see that the dogs had a lot of cortisol before, and then really a lot lower cortisol in the middle, and then it went back up. But we're not seeing it going up higher, which is what people often say. They say, oh, we're really stressing this dog out by kind of moving him around and putting him in this foster, and then he comes back. But that's not what the data is really necessarily showing us. And then as well, we also have the average longest bout of rest. So uh, that's how, I mean, obviously any rest is good, but we want uninterrupted rest, really, really restful rest, if you will. And so again, we have before, during, and after, and this is minutes, the average longest bout of rest. Uh, so before the shelter, and then longer after the sleepover, and then after the sleepover, I can't remember if these two were significantly different or not, but it's longer. So like they're actually kind of re retaining a little bit of this benefit. So even if they only have that benefit for the weekend, that's great. But if they can retain some of that benefit afterwards as well, that's even better. Um, and there is also a paper out there for cats. It's a little bit more recent. I think it's Vitaly et al. Um, it also didn't have as good of data to show, but like it's pretty of data. But it had showed a similar uh, outcome. I don't remember what the outcome parameters were. They're on my notes one. But they were also showing that there was some benefit, which I found surprising. I would have thought, I would have assumed cats would have a benefit from it. Or excuse me, dogs would have a benefit from it. But I was surprised to see cats also showed a benefit as well. I can't tell you exactly what that benefit was, but I encourage you to read her paper. It was really good. <laughs> really recently came out. Um, so yeah, that's the end of my talk for you today. I have a couple of resources on this slide here. Uh, if you want to do some more reading, we have Animal Behavior for Shelter Veterinarians and Staff, the second edition just come out, came out as this is a bit of a plug. I wrote a couple chapters in it, but it's a great book. <laughs> I really use the first edition as like a Bible when I was working uh, before the second one came out. I love, love, love it. Fear Free Shelters is a great resource because it's free and it shows it gives a lot of training. We make every staff and volunteer in our shelter take the training because it's free and it's really good. It tells you a lot about uh, body language. Um, and the considerate approaches, fear, anxiety, and stress, all that stuff. The guidelines for standards for care in animal shelters has a lot of, it has some really good behavior information as well. ASPCA Pro and maddiesfun.org uh, both have a lot of resources, uh, webinars, all that kind of stuff on there as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know how much, here's all our references if you're interested, but if anyone has, uh, if I have time for questions or if anyone has any questions, 